right, thank you so much. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen. Right. Could you please let me know, Becky, if you can see my screen? Yes, and it's full screen now, yes. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much, David, for uh, such an interesting uh, presentation. Mine is going to be very different. <laughs> Uh, I think which is the beauty of our school because we are so diverse here. So what I will be talking about today is the um, idea of creative practice based research, which uh, everyone who knows me knows I'm perfectly obsessed with. And uh, uh, today I'm going to be thinking about the ideas uh, which can lead us uh, towards the design of an effective support system. Um, so just a brief introduction. I'm a senior lecturer in film production. I know Becky uh, introduced me at the beginning, but there's going to be a couple of things I'll mention about the things I do towards the end of the presentation. But before I do it, uh, for the sake of uh, all of us knowing what is that thing I'm talking about today, I'll just bring um, a definition of practice based research. Um, there's lots of definitions of what practice-based research is, and there's lots of differences between uh, varieties of what could be described as such, but I'm going to base my um, presentation today on the very, very recent um, publication, which was released about, uh, or which was published about three months ago, uh, so uh, we can assume that this is what current situation of the researcher thinking about practice-based research is. So according to Veer, Edmonds and Candy, practice-based research is a principled approach to research by means of practice, in which the research and practice operate as independent and complementary process. I think these two uh, words are really important here, leading to new and original forms of knowledge. And what they explain as well in relation to this um, definition is that by practice, they mean taking purposeful actions within specific context, typically in a creative or professional way, and that could be the making, modifying or designing of objects, events or processes. So it's quite wide umbrella term if you, if you think about it um, in detail. Now, another resource I will be referring to quite a lot uh, in relation to this is, is my practice based research seminar. And it, it's, it's an interesting thing for me to do because I remember the last time I was talking about this seminar, I was talking about my own practice based research and my, my uh, kind of uh, participatory uh, filmmaking research I did in Colombia with indigenous filmmakers, and I was really excited about it. And a couple of years later, uh, I'm trying to uh, kind of uh, design uh, the best practices, how we can support anyone working within this kind of practice. So it's quite interesting for me to see how this how this journey uh, looks like for me. Uh, I'll talk more about what this uh, seminar uh, really is. What I want to say right now is at the beginning, at the opening of the seminar, so, which has been running for um, the last academic year, I asked the participant a question about what the research question was. And what I was expecting is this kind of uh, typical answers. Well, I'm making a film about so and so. I'm maybe uh, designing an installation, and uh, it was it was much more exciting um, and 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 um, diverse than that. So uh, if you look at the first answer, someone was working uh, on the investigation how European artisan footwear practices can inspire a craft-based slow fashion uh, fashion model, or how can visual communication, in this case, graphic design be used more systematically in reducing stigma to ma towards mental illness or how you can feel dance or do you have to see it? So we, we don't have time to analyze all the answers here. Uh, but what I want to um, point out to in here is that the, the, the answers were really, really surprising and varied. There was another person working with ceramics and Brexit, which was quite interesting as well. Um, this is um, another answer. Uh, to another question I've asked, which is to do with the artifact. So uh, many things uh, we can see here are to do with film, but there are also things like um, approach to construction, uh, lighting uh, installation, graphic videos, and so on and so forth. So this is a slide I borrowed from another presentation I did. So I'm sorry for anyone who's seen this one already, uh, but that's one of my um, favorite examples of what practice based research could look like. And this is an installation by um, um, a Nordic um, artist and chemist, um, Cecil Tolas, called the smell of, the smell of fear. So what she did, um, she extracted um, sweat from victims of violence and she distilled it and she painted big white canvas in the gallery space 
uh, with uh, with whatever it is that she distilled from that. And effectively, you could go to that gallery and smell the fear, which I find is, is quite unusual and really, really incredible. Um, so what I want to, to, to kind of bring it back here to is another definition, this time from Professor David Gauntlet, who says that the practice-based research is work where in order to explore uh, your research question, you need to make something as part of the process. So in effect, the research is exploratory and it's embedded in a creative practice. So, so practice doesn't um, serve the purpose of illustrating your research, is the way, is the means to answer your research question. I think this is the, probably the easiest way to understand what practice-based research really is. Uh, so going forward, another question I asked during the seminar was about training and guidance. So I'm kind of trying to uh, to kind of lead us towards this direction because we could talk for uh, many, many hours about what the idea of what practice-based research is. But if we're talking about designing the effective um, support system, of course, we need to uh, find out what has been missing for people who identify as practice-based researchers. And the interesting thing is, uh, which is not that surprising, the most people said uh, it's the idea of methodology. And I'll get back to that in my presentation later on, because in many cases, methodology is, is the very core of uh, practice-based researchers. And I'll talk a little bit about my uh, one of my PhD students in a moment. But before I do so, uh, other things people identify is a question on how to switch between research and practice-based research and how to bring the things together or perhaps how to understand how traditional assessment criteria are applied to artifacts produced through the research process. And I think this question is particularly interesting in a context of um, a PhD supervision. Uh, we will get back to that later as well. Another people, uh, another person uh, identified the question of how to even start thinking about art slash practice based research. So what will be the process, tools, principles? So not even methodologies, but how to even uh, wrap your head around it. Um, so another really valuable um, resource here is um, Desmond Spell's Research in a Creative Arts Media Challenging Practice um, book. And what Desmond Bell does, he asks the question whether we can actually teach uh, creative art research methods. And the reason he asks this question, because he compares it to the situation with the sciences. And what he says is that the sciences have their research methodologies, which are often quantitative and replicable in form. These are capable of delivering law-like uh, law -like generalizations about the natural world. But what is their equivalent in a creative arts and media where the core activity is focused on the making of a singular artwork? And I think it's a very, very interesting question, which not many people ask really. And personally, I find it quite problematic to talk about um, methodologies for practice-based research, because as I said before, very often the methodology is the core of research so you cannot necessarily uh, have a template which can apply to to all the other examples so it's really complex so to bring it back to the idea of of this presentation today so what is at stake what what is that we're talking about so of course when you're working with practice-based research in in creative arts you need to be fluent both in uh, research and in your relevant practice so my background is film and photography I did study film, I did study photography, but I also studied um, a, a very um, theoretical um, kind of research a master's degree. So I could safely say that I was retrained in both. And when it came to my PhD, uh, I didn't necessarily have enough support to kind of uh, to know how to run a practice base, uh, how to deliver a practice based PhD. But because I had background in both, I managed to bring it uh, together. But this is when I realized that there isn't really uh, a very clear support for anyone who who's working with practice-based research simply because uh, the projects are just so different and uh, they're not really easily uh, easily applicable to any template you can replicate uh, and, and, and teach in an easy way. Um, so that brings us to the question that the uniqueness of each project makes it really difficult to generalize. And as I said, designing new methodology might and very often is the main focus. I'll go back to uh, Libby in a second, but what she writes about and what she talks about is the process oriented view of research. So you very much focus on the process. And I think this is quite interesting and different from traditional research sometimes. And the idea of theory and practice working on equal rights. Now, there's another third element, which I'll uh, 
talk about in a moment, but this is this idea that there is no primacy of theory over practice or vice versa. They really kind of have to work in conjunction. conjunction. Uh, another really interesting thing which uh, she mentions is this idea that with your practice based research, you have uh, a lot of opportunities to unsettle stereotypes, challenge dominant ideologies and include marginalized voices and perspectives, which I think many practice based researchers do. Um, now, again, when I was preparing for this presentation, I thought, well, it would be actually useful to have a look at some um, other resources which uh, look at the idea of uh, training and supervision and, and preparation for um, kind of support we, we have for practice based uh, researchers and doctoral researchers. So I looked at um, this nice publication on supervising to inspire doctoral researchers by uh, Danicola Duke and Reeves. And what I really liked and what I found really applicable to practice based research is this idea of teaching research contingency plans. And what they do is they propose um, thinking about all the potential risks to completing uh, the research project, and it could be any research project really. But if you look at this graph on the left hand side, it's this idea of impact and likelihood. So, for example, if we think about uh, a film based practice based project, I'm just going to use my recent one as an example. So. As I said, I was working with indigenous communities in Colombia. I was filming with them. So there was lots of challenges over there. One of them being uh, the most obvious ones being them being available at a time and the location when we were filming uh, for me to record or document what is that they were doing. So obviously, if uh, in a case, if they were not available for uh, any kind of shooting, that would have a high impact and it would be very likely to completely um, to really highly affect my research project. So this uh, exercise is designed to uh, inspire researchers to think about any kind of plan B or contingency plans for anything which is absolutely crucial for their project and how that could be replaced. So the main focus of the project is not uh, lost in the process. And I, I, I again, I will get back to that uh, when I talk about um, one of the case studies I'll, I'll be analyzing in brief. So I don't want to talk about the historical dragon of practice based research uh, too much, but so I just very, very briefly mention um, uh, Linda Candy, who is one of the uh, pioneers of uh, contextualizing practice based research. So in one of her articles, uh, she brings back the history of practice based research uh, to 1994, when two universities in Australia uh, introduced doctorates in creative writing. Now, uh, bringing this back to the uh, UK, so um, we should uh, look at the, uh, at the um, um, program offered by Polytechnics, uh, where we have strong emphasis on practice. So the first one being uh, what is now the Uni University of Westminster in London, which was funded in 19 uh, sorry, 1838. And, and according to Candy, what happened with, with the introduction of the emphasis on practice with the, within the polytechnics is that the higher education was no longer to be seen as a center of new understanding of knowledge that described the world, but also, and I think it's quite important, as a center of the new ways of doing things and knowledge which was improved, uh, which, that improved our ability to act in the world. And I think uh, that makes it quite interesting. And I think this is a good moment to mention that uh, Staffordshire University was founded as a polytechnic institution that was in 1914, and we gained our um, official university status on um, 16th of June uh, in 1992. So we definitely have a lot of uh, great uh, history to um, talk about when it comes to practice and practice based research. So in one of my previous slides, I mentioned this idea of theory and practice and how one should not have primacy over the other. But there's a third element and many researchers. And again, this is not a place for me to kind of go through a history of practice based research and all the different uh, theories behind it. But many people do identify the reflective evaluation as the difference which kind of uh, identify uh, practice based research from uh, traditional um, practice or ju just practice in any kind of artistic and creative uh, point of oh I've, I've lost my PowerPoint here it is uh, creative practice but I think another way to look at the difference between and this is a question which many people ask sometimes is this idea of what is the difference between my creative practice and my creative practice as a form of research is that that we do research when we seek to amend our knowledge and I think it it, it is the difference and again I think we could um 
we could spend a long, long time discussing this tension, which I personally experienced in kind of very uh, uh, intense way, how sometimes when you when you're involved in in um, a research project, especially when you're coming from uh, let's say photography and filmmaking background, uh, you you see certain situations and you just want to follow your creative instincts, where in fact what you have to do uh, has to lead to a different kind of actions. Because rather than just focusing on certain aesthetics, for example, uh, you need to follow uh, what's going on in front of your camera. So so sometimes the reasons why you're doing what you're doing is 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 very contradictory. And I think it, it it's really interesting when you get to this reflective evaluation of what is the difference between your research and creative practice. And again, a uh, long discussion we can unpack um, at another occasion. So going back to uh, Patricia Levy, I think one of the things she uh, introduces in her handbook of arts-based research is uh, skills uh, which she thinks arts-based practitioners need. And there are lots of interesting things over there. So some of the things she writes about are flexibility, openness and intuition, thinking conceptually, symbolically, uh, metaphorically and thematically, ethical practice and value system, but at the same time, things like thinking like an artist, uh, which again, uh, I think there's lots of things we could potentially unpack. Uh, and I, again, this is a conversation for um, way more time than 20 minutes here. But I think um, it's we, we can easily assume that thinking like an artist could be uh, the stark opposition to what you will assume or associate with um, a researcher, a traditional researcher uh, qualities. And another thing will be thinking like a public intellectual. So uh, again, lots of lots of interesting things uh, to um, think about. And then, of course, uh, the reason I put it here is because uh, I wonder from a perspective of, a, of someone who supports uh, new and um, emerging practice based researchers. How do you teach this kind of things? How do you support? How do you make someone flexible, open? and uh, tune to their intuition? How do you make them think, think, um, think like an artist? Um, so now we're moving on to one of the case studies. So again, uh, this is a very interesting one. I'm going to just uh, kind of point to some uh, elements of, of this uh, specific case study. So what we're looking at right now is the case study from the Institute of Creative Technology at the, uh, the Montfort University here in England. And uh, what they did, they developed strategies for supporting practice, uh, PhD practice based research, and they designed something they called an ecosystem. And this ecosystem has seven components. It's, it's quite interesting and perhaps some of the things is something we can uh, bring back to uh, Staffordshire at some point. So the first thing is that there is a dedicated doctoral program in practice based research. So it's not just a PhD program, it's a PhD program in practice based research specifically. Uh, what links to that is that they have a training program for this. Uh, which they provide within the university. Uh, following that, there is an online what they called a cookbook of methods and practices, and I'll show you an example of what that looks like in a second. They do have a summer school of intense uh, intensive workshops and activities. They have a shared space and a taught postgraduate program. They have an associated network of practitioners, and this is a good moment to mention that this is not just to do with PhD students, but anyone involved with practice based research. So it's not just uh, PhD candidates, but just everyone, uh, which I think creates a nice uh, dynamic within. Uh, and also um, the final thing they have is the creative technologies in residence program. Now, what they do uh, within this, uh, so just going back here, within this doctoral program, what they do, they have a series of uh, projects. So it's not that um, uh, you just have your project and your dissertation, they just uh, work on kind of annual basis. So there's a, one project in year one, another one on year two, and a one, another one on year three, and they kind of build on top of each other. So they kind of grow uh, from the first project, you kind of build up uh, to create a second one and so on and so forth. And this is the root map they uh, they use for this. So some of the things are pretty uh, pretty obvious, but I think there's some interesting points here uh, we should mention. So we st we start with uh, the conceptualization and proposition design based on the rationale. Uh, they define research questions, aims, issues, problems, and objectives. They move on to the research strategies, methods, work plan, timelines, 
milestones and uh, things they have to deliver, funding, dissemination and documentation. And they propose an agile uh, experimental uh, of open process. And I, I think that's quite uh, interesting, this idea of being experimental. I think it's, it's quite a, a brave approach here, which I personally really like. They collate data, uh, or evidence or art artefacts, whatever they might be, and they bring it back and kind of decode it against the initial research question or issues or problems. They have a pre preliminary discussion and they explore further problems, issues or challenges which can arise from this project. And again, they kind of wrap it up with documentation, dissemination, scrutiny and sharing. So this is an example of the online cookbook of methods and practice. I, I really like the idea. However, I have to say that uh, the idea kind of uh, falls short of expectations for you because really effectively what it is, it's a website which has a couple of case studies from different PhD researchers and the, their interviews with them and they're kind of divided in different sections. But because it doesn't seem to be updated and there's not that many examples, it looks like a great idea but perhaps it doesn't meet uh, its full potential. But it kind of goes back to one of the um, questions or asks some of the people from my seminar series were identifying. So it's just kind of to have more examples of pe people working with different kind of creative methods, um, research projects and how they go about their journey. So in a way, I think it's a really good idea, although I think it has uh, more potential that it actually delivers. Now, going back to this ecosystem, again, there's a couple of interesting things uh, I think we should mention over there. And I think uh, what they really focus on uh, in detail over there is this relationship of practice and knowledge generation within the community of researchers, So, as we said before. And the three points uh, which underpin the philosophy of the ecosystem. So number one is creative play and rapid prototyping. Number two is the flat structure and management, meaning leading or inspiring from bottom up. And number three is 10 rules for students and teachers. And I've identified uh, four of my favorites. So num rule number four is to consider everything an experiment, uh, which I think is a fantastic rule uh, for anyone working with anything uh, creative. Rule number six, nothing is a mistake. There is no win or fail. There's only make. Uh, definitely anyone who works with anything uh, from creative practice can identify with that. Rule number eight, don't try to create and analyze at the same time their different processes. And my favorite rules of all, uh, we're breaking all the rules. I think it's really, uh, again, important uh, in relation to anything uh, creative. Uh, although <laughs> uh, you could argue that it's uh, quite controversial if you think about traditional research, but I think it's really important to have it there. So uh, I know I'm running out of time slowly, so I'm going to, for the last five minutes, talk a little bit about what I do. So this is the research. I, by no means I want to make it a self-promotion here, but I think it's important to kind of uh, bring uh, this idea of what this uh, research seminar series is. So the reason I designed it is because I realized, as I said before, that uh, we kind of need to bring some support for anyone working within creative practice research, because all the support we have is, is targeted at people working with traditional research. So what I was trying to do is to design something which follows a structure of what a normal journey of practice-based research would look like. So uh, this is just a, um, a screenshot from some of the series, but it starts with the idea of what uh, practice-based research is, how to manage this tension between creativity and research, uh, moving on to creative methods, uh, the idea of being transdisciplinary, postdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, uh, uh, the question of dissemination, um, impact. Um, again, this is just a case study of moving image because that's, that's again, my discipline, ref, uh, the role of ref reflective practice and moving into the idea of uh, designing this uh, ideal or kind of uh, effective practice-based research support. The seminar has uh, teams and what I always ask people to do is to bring uh, core readings and some case studies so we can discuss things, we can have a presentation, discuss the text, but also look at case studies and discuss it further. And of course, the sessions are uh, recorded. Now, uh, this is one of the other questions I ask the participants during the research, and this is what about uh, this is about training and guidance, uh, which is uh, needed. So there were three questions, and I'm just going to very, very quickly show you a couple of interesting answers. So this is about the most valuable learning people have um, uh, identified. And the pe one person says, 
uh, researching and reading previous PhD, PhD researchers' thesis alongside their artifacts, which so is basically getting familiar with what kind of things people do. Uh, another person is encountering different perspectives, different approaches to tackling research questions. So again, this idea of diversity, there is no uh, template, if you like, to approach this kind of projects, but there's lots of different ways. And learning from uh, case sharing, knowing about current challenges and how people deal with them. So really kind of around the same uh, ideas here. And in terms of uh, what kind of training and support uh, they felt they were missing, uh, many people say, well, any anything about uh, practice as research. A general introduction to, to what it actually really is. So there's still lots of confusion, not only about uh, the practitioners, but also institutions, universities, networks. There's, there's so many different um, discussions around it, but I, I have a feeling they're still not uh, kind of um, um, a un kind of voice which is uh, everyone agrees with. Another person says understanding what practice based research really is and how to even produce a proposal in the first place. And another one really interesting. Someone says, if I'm not, if I'm not an artist, what skills should I uh, prepare or gain from now on? And I think this brings us to the question that may, in many cases, I would say in most cases, people working with practice based research are people who are, who are coming from creative practice background and they move into research. But uh, they could be um, there could be examples of people who, and I do know people like that, who, who just realized that creative practice would be a really nice way to, to um, progress with their research. So it's, it's really interesting. So now I'm moving towards the summary. And uh, before I move on to my summary, I wanted to kind of uh, summarize from uh, some really valid points from uh, Robin Nelson, uh, from him, his seminal practice as research in the arts uh, publication. So what Robin Nelson suggests sometimes that this idea of research question is not really very clear with practice based research. So this, this research question, as we understand it uh, traditionally, could be really contested over here. And he talks about things obviously to do with ethics and quality and originality of practice. So how we can manage that, uh, the integration of theory into professional practice, but also documentation and documentation of the process. Now, now th this is a, obviously a huge uh, simplification because it's impossible to kind of unpack everything in here, but there are important points to, to mention. Now, uh, other, ki other kind of things we should talk about here is this idea of community building and network. And that brings us back to this idea of questions of identity. And I did talk about um, that in different places. But what many people working with practice-based research experience sometimes is this idea of not belonging. So uh, just to use my example, um, for to, to make it easy for a long time i identified myself as a filmmaker and photographer uh, but then i started working with uh, indigenous communities in latin america so i i thought about myself as a latin americanist uh, but then i started working with practice-based research and i started working with film so i started thinking about myself again as a, a film uh, practitioner in a different context and it's very different uh, difficult sorry for, for for many people to really place themselves and find a community uh, and the community means uh, the journal you go to the conferences you go to the place you publish your um, your research it's really difficult for people working with practice based research because of how very interdisciplinary practice based research is by definition sometimes it's problematic and that's why many people feel very isolated because they don't know what community they should uh, really belong to uh, so i think it's really important to bring this kind of community of practice based researchers where all these things are brought together under the umbrella of practice based research in creative arts and this way we can create some more um, applicable support system, uh, which of course is not going to fit every single project, but has some kind of common ground. The idea of navigating the unknown, I think it's pretty uh, obvious from this presentation that that's what we're all dealing with. Uh, and this idea of bespoke learning and research design is not going to be, as I said many times today, a template for you to apply and just uh, kind of deliver your research. You, you will have to um, customize everything you do in terms of your own learning and research. But there's lots of benefits uh, from crossing disciplines to general, general, um, generate new knowledge throughout practice. And hopefully what that can lead to is some cultural shifts in uh, practice-based research. So really final things, what you see on the right hand side as a tweet I was tagged in um, at uh, yesterday, just, just a couple of hours before I started preparing this. 
uh, presentation, which was really nice. Uh, so that someone working with um, design of a pattern inspired printmaking for Asian wedding um, fabric as a form of practice based research was yet another uh, really great example of uh, the variety within practice based research. So what you see on the left hand side is a publication I'm currently working on. And um, if there's anyone in the public who would like to provide any feedback or discuss that with me, I'll be absolutely delighted. So what I try to uh, build uh, is um, a form of toolkit for practice based researchers and specifically here working with with film. And I was thinking for a very long time on how to really approach that. And what I decided to do is to replicate the structure of the seminar. Uh, which is to really look at the entire trajectory, entire journey of, of uh, designing this kind of project. So starting from eight, uh, sorry, starting from definitions of what this practice based research really means, this division between creative uh, artistic ambitions and uh, your your um, academic rigor as a researcher, uh, the idea of uh, interdisciplinarity, designing effective methodology, which is going to really apply to your project, Again, balancing theory, practice and reflective evaluation, but also what's happening afterwards. So this uh, disseminating practice based research is, is really problematic. And that's one of the things I really um, try to um, do a couple of things about. Also, how you measure impact from this kind of research. And again, going back to this idea of uh, support system. So the final slide is about a couple of other things I do. And, and, and this is the point. Um, I would like to use as a invitation for anyone who's working with practice based research um, who has anything um, uh, they want to share with me to get in touch. I'll be really delighted to hear from you just to hear about your experience as a researcher, but also someone who potentially um, supervises practice based researchers or, or works with other people working with practice based. Um, you can get involved in any other things you see here. So the seminar series is going to have a second round in the new academic year. Perhaps you want to talk about your research. There's going to be a podcast, uh, which I'm working on with um, one of my colleagues from the department. Of course, there is a conference. Tony was kind enough to mention. So this conference is designed to be uh, one of the forms of kind of showcasing practice based research in general. And there's also editorial work I do for the International Journal of Creative Media Research. So all the all these uh, activities are really focused uh, on this idea of, of uh, what practice based research is and how we can uh, collectively as a community think about the way to make it easier on us and, and disseminate it, make our voice um, visible uh, in, in what's going on. Uh, so yes, please get in touch if you have anything you'd like to share. So I think that's it from me. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't take too much time. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Let me go back here. Thank you very much, Agatha. No, perfect. Um, again, so much in there and uh, really important work, particularly for um, you know, a school like ours, uh, where so much of the work that's happening across um, all the different fields really uh, touches on practice, um, you know, in relation to research. So uh, brilliant. Now, um, I would love to see some questions out there. I've got a couple of questions, but if anyone has a question straight away that they're desperate to or, or a comment that they want to contribute, um, either just pop your hand up or pop it in the chat. Um, otherwise, you're just going to have to listen to my questions, which, uh, you know, they're just my questions. So I'm going I'm to start off. Uh, David, if I can cycle back to your talk and I can, you know, I think as I was sort of trying to think through um, your research, I was imagining how much you had to leave out. So uh, I, uh, you know, I think probably what I'm going to ask is is just a very surface question. But I was really interested in the way that you introduced um, your modeling and 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 you're saying that within that your your um, th that these were this modeling could be applied to economics or economies and or ecologies. And I thought it was really uh, maybe it was a really interesting commonality. I was uh, what what is the commonality between an economy and an ecology that means that the modelling would work across both? Um, I'd say that when I've developed this simulation, um, the kind of the, it's 
I suppose the difference I'll start, I'll start with the difference is that the stuff that you're measuring. So with this, the the things I was measuring are, if you like, based on e economic equations. So like satisfaction. So how um, how, how happy or un unhappy am I that my kind of neighbour earns more more or less than me? Um, these are kind of based in in, in kind of economic principles so I, I as a kind of modeler I can't just think oh I'll assign a value between you know one and ten or something I have to kind of do that and if I was doing it in an ecology then I would have to um, you know go with the equations that the marine biologists have have, have kind of you know discovered or, or created so for example if I was measuring the growth rate of, of you know starfish um, I, I would kind of you know use a, a, an equation that a biologist has said actually star, starfish in water temperatures of x degrees you know they would grow this this amount a month or so on the the similarity is is the the, the idea of these are agents and they have simple rules and they they are simply responding to their environment and it, and it doesn't matter if it's in a fish <laughs> it's probably a, a bit derogatory a fish or a, or a stockbroker but um <laughs> they kind of how they kind of react to their environment is is pretty much the same really um and you know they have that simple rules i think it's uh, maslow's hierarchy of needs is a kind of nice way of you know first of all you need to survive and then you know as you go go up that kind of that that triangle you get things like um uh, you know, like artistic, artistic desires and, and, and ambition and things like that. Uh, and, and you can build these things in, into the kind of decisions and needs of, of agents. Yeah, fascinating. Because I think, and I don't know if this, uh, this isn't perhaps connected to this question, but, um, and the other thing, and this might just be me and my need for everything to be political, is you're saying that you're not trying to answer economic questions mm -hmm. with this, but it does seem through the kind of outcomes that you found in your research that that there there are two ideological kind of um, possibilities that you're kind of comparing and it seems that your modeling is coming out in favor of one you know the kind of market forces neoliberal no or is that um, well it kind of when you when when i based it on economics it's it, it, there's a kind of i suppose a clear distinction between um, the, the two simulations, and, and if you like, um, you know, so perhaps the co communist countries, and, and of course we do it to a degree in kind of liberal democracies as well, where you know somebody makes a decision about the price of bread, and you know, and, and then the alternative is a market-based economy, which is basically I say, well, I, I, I'm going to sell this loaf of bread, I'm going to try and sell it as much as I can, but I'm well aware that if I set the price too high, you know, nobody will buy it. If I set it too low, well, I won't make a profit. And, and and there is, I guess, that. And I kind of, I do have a personal kind of, I suppose, opinion there. But really, um, and, and, and something that I really tried to kind of emphasise in the paper itself is what makes better, what, you know, what makes a better simulation? You know, what what's perhaps what's more realistic? Um, uh, you know, uh, what, how, how does, if we we're going to make a decision on how we build these simulations, because one of the problems with building these types of simulations is how to make them resilient and, and actually survive over time. Because simulations, in the first instance, tend to die. <laughs> as, in, as in, if you have a population of people, if you if you don't build it right, they tend to just all die within the first few weeks of just because you need to calibrate it. Um, so you know, if if we're building these simulations, how do we make them more resilient um, and so on? I mean, for example, in a, in an ecology, of course, you don't get uh, you know, um, in a real, you know, in in a marine biosystem, bio system, you know, unless you've kind of got fishermen or something, but assuming not, you could design a simulation where actually say, well, I'm going to, you have it like, if you like, a part of that program, which decides what all these kind of different components are going to do. And the alternative to that is, it's perhaps it's a bit more difficult, but then you say to all these fish, starfish and algae and so on, they are going to respond to their environment. Um, and that if you think of it in that way, th that takes away that kind of idea of how an economy should be run to actually how should we build a simulation? And perhaps I think ecosystems are probably a better example of of, of that, I guess. Right. Uh, yes, I, I see. I think, yes, because then otherwise, well, for, for lay people like myself, we get hoodwinked into thinking this is a vote for a particular 
yeah, management yeah. system of humans, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Um, OK, I'm going to cross over to Agatha and I'm, all, I'm conscious of time. And, and again, I would, Agatha, obviously I've got loads of questions, but you and I need to have a chat outside of this forum, I think. Um, but I think in, 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 in relation to what you're talking about, and I, I so clearly see that the, 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 um, the terrain that you're trying to map out for arts-based researchers, um, but perhaps the thing that you didn't have time to, to touch on so much this time was, you know, within the institution, um, assessment is such a problematic thing. I mean, I think you did briefly mention it, you know, do it, do it, you know, do you assess the artefact? If you do, what are the tools of assessment that are, that are brought to bear on that artefact, given that it's not a studio practice only, it's a research based studio practice. So, you know, we're not looking at a, um, at an artwork and assessing it in, in sort of formal terms, etc. cetera. We're, we're looking at it in relation to a, a research question. Um, and I wonder whether that, uh, uh, and also I guess that in terms of impact, you know, how are we measuring impact when it, when it relates to research-based practice rather than research simply, you know? I think those, those are really problematic ideas, aren't they? Yeah, um, thank you, Becky. That's, <laughs> Uh, two really good questions, uh, really difficult to answer, really. I mean, the first question about the assessment, I think it goes back to the criteria. And, and you did mention that, you know, it depends on what the purpose of the artefact is and depends on module it is, depends on what level it is, you'll be looking at different kinds of things, really. So again, if we look, if we take film as an example, if you um, teaching level four students and you're just teaching them craft, you just want to make sure that they have a capacity to make uh, a you know coherent film which follows a kind of um, film grammar and things like that. Now, when you're looking at PhD student or someone early career researcher, which they're using film for research, then of course uh, that um, is almost taken for granted that they know what they're doing in terms of the kind of technical standpoint, and we don't have to worry about that. And we're looking at the way they apply. Uh, this specific medium into research and of course uh, this is very very difficult question how you measure this. I personally have lots of problems with this and we definitely should have a conversation about it and I, I talked about it many times as I said like sometimes I just want to take beautiful photographs that's what I want to do especially when I work in, in beautiful places and then I am very very painfully aware that that's not the reason why I'm there and I have to think constantly about the research question I have and what is what is that I'm actually uh, trying to achieve here? So again, going back to aims and objectives, and I think this kind of conversation, this kind of things has to be applied in terms of marking criteria, whatever level we're talking about, and what is the, uh, again, aim and objective of, 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 of what you're trying to do. Now, second thing, second question was more about, um, sorry, could you remind me of second question? Just so, well, it was sort of connected because I'm thinking about, as you know, assessing assessing the work, and I guess you, one of the assessment criteria could be impact. Yeah. But you know, again, is it the impact of the artifact, or is it the impact of the research to make the artifact? Yeah. Is it both? I mean, yeah. So impact. So again, of course, we have ref, uh, where impact is again, and, and all the things uh, related to uh, impact in in a way we assess our research in any kind of form and shape, and there's certain things you need to uh, hit, if you like, to make your uh, your research impactful and the way you measure it, the way you capture impact. And again, this is a conversation again for uh, a completely different thing. But I, th I think what we need, and I think this is what I'm kind of trying to <laughs> uh, initiate in some way or another, as, as a collective of academics working with this kind of things, we should have a conversation about how this impact looks like for different kinds of project on different levels. and how does it relate to what we are measured on in terms of ref? Is it a very different conversation? Should it be exactly the same? How can you measure it? So it, it does come back to the first question you asked me about assessment, because it's about like from basically what, we, what we're trying to ask uh, or answer here is like, what is the angle we're looking at? Or, we, or what is the point of view? What's the perspective we want to apply when we look at, at these artifacts, whatever they might be? Mm. Well, how do we measure uh, success? If you like, or what has I been agree. Yeah. I, Sorry. yeah, I don't know. I don't think the answer is going to be really easy, but I think this conversation has to happen and it has to happen across the board, not just at Staffs University, but really way beyond. And I think this conversation has to continue for us to make sure that we don't 
get conf continuously get confused about, uh, you know, um, why practice based research is a really, really val valuable uh, form of research. Just one more thing. I know we're running out of time, but I promise I'm going to be very brief. In terms of impact, I do believe personally that creative uh, based research or practice based research in creative arts is a, in a very privileged position when it comes to impact simply because it seems accessible for so-called general public. People tend to be interested in film photography, uh, fashion, in, you name it. And so we have it easier perhaps to communicate our research uh, to wider uh, audiences, therefore have more impactful impact. So you saying this on purpose like this, <laughs> just to kind of underline the importance. Of it. So, so perhaps uh, we should try to think about strat strategies or how to make the most of this. Yeah, I think that's re that's really well put. I mean, I, th I think it was interesting looking at the De Montford kind of route map uh, that you showed, which which had lots of great stuff in it, I thought. But it did seem that that, that really the whole PhD journey, you know, what they're assessing, what all the, the markers were the journey and the artifact, whatever that was, was sort of almost relegated to a kind of maybe it just wasn't, you know, so I think I, I, I kind of not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that's interesting when you when when you perhaps come into that process as a maker to then, you know, go on that journey. Um, I do also I mean, this is just me and I'm just chucking it in at the end here. I think it's interesting that I come from a photographic background. So do you, you know, photography has always been the art outsider, you know, mm -hmm. and then and now sort of practice based research within the institution is the kind of academic outsider, you know, and I think at a certain point, that's not even a question anymore. You know, mm -hmm. is it art? Is it is it research? You know, at a certain point, hopefully we get to kind of put that aside. Oh, very much. So, so. And <laughs> just do the work, but we'll see. Um, do you guys have questions for each other or anything you any any other comment or anything you'd like to to put out there? That's a bit of a curveball, isn't it? Does anyone yeah. else? Is, there are still people. Yeah, go. Sorry. No, I just want to say I really love what David was talking about. I find it so fascinating, but I, 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 I don't feel an ex, uh, you know, um, I, ha I have an, enough expertise to actually ask any um, sophisticated enough question, I'm afraid, but I just really loved it. So that's what I can say. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, it's not really a question. I suppose it's more of a, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I've been thinking about practice, but what is practice based research? And obviously you're the you're the expert. And I'm, I'm wondering kind of where, like, say, so somebody write, writes a computer program uh, and that, I don't know, that gets sold on the Internet. It isn't a formal academic process, but, you know, that person could have, you know, it is a it isn't, if you like, a, an expertise. Um, and you know, and it kind of answers, I suppose, I don't know, what sort of questions would it answer? I don't know. But would that, if, if say someone had spent, you know, a long time creating programs like computer games, for example, and making computer games, do you think there's a, as a, as a practice based research element to that? Does it, I suppose, does it need to answer a particular question? Do you think? It's a, it's a great question, David. So again, from my perspective, the way I like to think about practice based research is if your practice is absolutely essential, produce an outcome which is in why one way or another uh, an answer to your research question that's practice based research so um yeah, yeah. as little as i understand from <laughs> uh, you know writing uh, you know uh, doing things like that probably the answer is yes if, if so 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 if if writing the, the program is the essential part of the research and without that you wouldn't be able to get the answer to to what you're doing that's that's absolutely a yes yeah. okay cool yeah. Would you kind of need to kind of write it having that question in mind, do you think? Well, this is the discussion. So uh, I know Carola is in um, in the audience. I don't know if Carola, you want to add it. So again, Robin Nelson was talking, it was questioning a little bit this idea of research question. And there are other people who, who talk about it, like whether there is a need uh, of having a proper research question. Personally, I think it's really helpful to have it. Mm -hmm. so you know what direction you're having. Sometimes it's more difficult to, to have it in really clear and of course it's going to change in the process but I personally like having research questions and when I when I supervise my uh, my PhD candidates I like them to have a research question and they usually arrive at the answer to a different question at the end which is absolutely fine 
but at least it gives them a sense of direction. I don't know if you want to add yeah. something to this, Carola, from your, your perspective. Yeah, and fascinating, and thank you. Um, the, 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 what uh, what what I like is the phrase of a line of inquiry, and that helps me to understand that it might just not be one question or exactly three questions, but it is a line of inquiry which has a trajectory as such. And that's a phrase that, that Robin Nelson also uses. But it also might be useful to, to remember that in this field, uh, these two different methodologies come at it quite differently. You know, we have the, the more traditional scientific linear approach where you do set a research question at the beginning and you have a hypothesis and you try it to find out what it means. But actually, again, in some other subject areas, not just art, but also the humanities, you actually have these different lines of inquiries or different questions that try to uh, understand a suggested type of reality that that represents a new knowledge. So, so you have this um, this coming at it from different perspectives, and it's actually the weight of opinions or justified opinions of what reality is, which creates new knowledge. So it's not this empirical. This is this is what it is. It's rather this weight of opinion that creates a likely answer to the to the questions. That that's more more. Um, often the case. I think it's a really well said. If I can just maybe give you an example, I think Carola just really said it very nicely. I'm going to give you an example of one of my PhD students because I think it's <laughs> a nice way to kind of understand how practice based research can look like. So he he uh, got a scholarship for a funded PhD, uh, which was a title uh, Sonic Landscape of a Documentary Form. So effectively what, what we tasked him with, task, tasked him with was uh, kind of uh, uh, challenging the uh, primacy of visuals in documentary filmmaking, where sound is usually talking heads and is kind of secondary. And we wanted him to explore uh, and, and experiment with the ways of giving sound the primacy of, of uh, documentary storytelling or narrative. And that's what he's doing, how he's going to do it. It's entirely up to him. So he has to, this is not necessarily a research question. This is the direction he has to go. So he has to design his methodologies in a way he wants and, and feels fit to. And he has to find some kind of answer, some kind of way to, to kind of disrupt this, this primacy, as I said before. So it is not sense of strict research question. But this is this kind of uh, sense of inquiry Carola is talking about. He's just heading some direction and then it, it doesn't necessarily has to have an answer to research question, but he has to have some kind of practice which answers this uh, line of inquiry. I, I like that term line of inquiry. Um, I think PhD students, so my PhD students, they tend to struggle at the beginning, um, you know, in finding, you know, a research question. And I think, yeah, using the term line of inquiry which then leads onto a research question is probably a nice way of putting it, I think. Yeah. I mean, it leads, it leads back to my, one of the questions I showed you in the presentation when someone was asking, how do I even go about <laughs> writing a proposal for practice-based uh, project? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it starts there. It's sometimes, and I think it sometimes, sometimes feels intimidating. And it goes back again to this question of identity. People try to kind of look at the networks they identify with and sometimes they don't have an answer over there because they might be, again, like using my example, maybe I will be looking at the network of uh, Latin Americanists and I don't find anything over there which relates to the kind of work I do. So it's it's a really complex thing, but I think that's why creating this kind of support system is extremely important and really, really needed. Mm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. And yeah, thanks, Carola, for, for um adding that in that was really uh helpful i think it's five o'clock unless anyone uh really suddenly has a light bulb moment which i, I don't think is going to happen i think we'll wrap it up there so i'm really happy um that you guys could do this thank you so much it was really fascinating uh thanks to everyone that was present um, thank you, Agatha, for reminding me to record it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm afraid we might have missed the very front little section, which was just me waffling on. Um, but apart from that, um, it will go up on, there is a YouTube channel and I must send the link to everybody um, where all the talks have gone. So it will it will live up there. And um, thanks very much and enjoy everybody's long weekend. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. All Bye. right. Bye. Thanks Bye. very much. Bye. Bye.